Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the bullpen. In the bullpen today, he's back. We have Mr. Christian Daytok, White House correspondent, Washington Examiner. Christian, good day, welcome. Good to be back with you, Dr. Ritchie, it's always a pleasure. Pleasure is mine. So we are going to chop it up about two things in particular. Uh, the nomination process for Judge Jackson and what she's going through right now. Uh, and also I wanna highlight Clarence Thomas's wife, Virginia Thomas. Because she has now recently publicly said, yes, I was at the Stop the Steal rally. And how does that complicate things for Justice Thomas? I don't want to presume what you know or believe about those items. Let's start with the nomination of Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson. And what are your thoughts and sentiment about that? Well, we know that the confirmation process is heating up. Judge Brown Jackson has been up on the Hill meeting with Democrats and Republicans for the past couple of weeks now. And I think this is going to be a much smoother hearing process than we've seen, certainly during the Amy Coney Barrett confirmation process. And of course, during the Brett Kavanaugh disaster, I think is probably the best way to describe it. But let's be honest, Judge Brown Jackson might be the most qualified person to serve on the Supreme Court who has been nominated, at least in my brief tenure as a political reporter. And while Republicans don't necessarily have the votes to block her confirmation, I do expect some on the, on the committee to sort of do the dog and pony show, play to their base and try and grill her as much as possible. Now I will say, I think the only one potential legitimate critique of her nomination doesn't have anything to do with her legal career, doesn't have anything to do with her character as a person. It's merely the fact that she's a graduate of Harvard University. And there was a groundswell movement to have a next you know, SCOTUS justice, you know, be representative of the people in the fact that they graduated from a public university. So uh, I think that's a minor detail and I don't expect it to, to make headways. Uh, but this should be an interesting week just to see how far Republicans want to play into the politics of it. Yeah, it is interesting. And I think Joe Biden made a very strategic move by nominating uh, Judge Jackson because literally Republicans, many Republicans just voted to confirm her last year. Uh, and so for example, Lindsey Graham, who voted to confirm her at her current position, then did an about face when she was nominated for the Supreme Court and said, this is proof that the radical left is winning. Well, that means if you follow his linear logic, that means that he is helping the radical left win because he voted in support of her judicial position currently. And then you have some of the even more ridiculous things that have surfaced because of this nomination. You have Tucker Carlson demanding her LSAT scores. You have Ted Cruz who says she never, he never liked her because he did not want to drink his coffee in his office, okay? I wouldn't drink Ted Cruz's coffee, all right? But it's all of these things that have nothing to do with her actual judicial philosophy, nor ability to interpret the Constitution, which is the primary objective of the Supreme Court. So why do you think there's so much external dynamic in the conversation that has nothing to do with the internal process of being an actual judge? Well, I think we're getting all this external critiques primarily because she is just so qualified. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you can't knock her record, you go and start picking at anything. You start drawing straws out of thin air to try and make it seem like she might be, to quote Lindsey Graham again, again, just less than a year after he voted to confirm her to the circuit court. You know, They want to make this a win for the quote unquote radical left or the socialist left or whatever they're, they're calling the progressive wing of the Democratic Party these days. I do think there is a chance that Lisa Murkowski of Alaska and Susan Collins of Maine will vote to confirm her. And that would be a massive win for President Biden. It won't have anything to do with how Judge Brown Jackson serves as a justice on the Supreme Court. But if President Biden is trying to run heading into 2022 midterms and heading into the 2024 reelection cycle as this unifier, he has to get Republicans on board with some of his major moves in the White House. And this is probably going to be one of the few times, at least in this calendar year, that he might get Republicans voting for any initiative that he brings to the table. 
You know, there's unprecedented tribalism in politics right now. You know it, you're a political reporter. And when you talk to some of these elected officials off record, many of them sound like they have common sense until you put a microphone in front of their face. Do you see that changing anytime soon, maybe post presidential election or at some point in the near future? I don't see it in the near future. I'd like to think that this could happen again. You know, I think there are some of the members of the sort of populist wing of the Republican Party who got very close to endorsing some of the uh, the proponents of the Build Back Better agenda, whether it was extending the child tax credit uh, to that expanded pandemic level, whether it was instituting some type of paid family leave uh, at, at a grand or national scale. So I, I think there is some hope for potential bipartisanship again in Washington. But again, you know, with elections coming every two years, with just the way the national media is really inflaming this divide between Republicans and Democrats. I'm not sure it's going to happen until at least Donald Trump is formally 100% out of the picture. Let me ask you this because I think politics has de-evolved to this power grab and nothing more. So let me give you the scenario. I see men and women in political power fighting to obtain, retain and expand their political power. And what they will do is they use policy as pawns. They're not using policy to advocate for actual change or for the best benefit of their community. They're using them as pawns. So what they will do is select a policy, make a big deal about a policy in order to retain or expand their power. They're not thinking about the actual end result of that policy. We have We have come so far away from a policy centric American government, where now the battles are really just battles of the elite in many ways. And they have very little to do with the people that may suffer because of these policies. And then the other trick they play is they will sell to those people that vote for them. No, this is actually a good policy for you because here's what it will do for you. Knowing good and damn well, that's a lie. They will create and craft a narrative a message around the policy because they know that if they actually understood what the policy would do to the average American, the average American would reject it. Am I off basis here, Christian? I think you're right. And I think there's a number of bills, especially down with our friends in Florida that we've seen pop up in the last several years that that you know illustrate that point. If you take this controversial don't say gay bill, yeah. To account, uh, you know how many how many schools in the state, let alone across the country, are having heart to heart, you know, conversations about sex and gender with children between kindergarten age and third grade. Yet, let right. alone this has become a major hill for Republicans to die on. It just doesn't really make sense, and I think it's people crafting policy that's sort of coming out of these culture wars, uh, what have you. And and there, and I think you're right. This is not necessarily trying to help people who put them in power. This is solely about expanding that power grab and trying to make sure that you can stay in office as long as possible. Yeah, we call it red meat legislation. It does nothing but feed the red meat or the extremist of your party and provides absolutely no remedy in the social or political construct. Let me jump to something that just got exposed this week. Publicly for the first time, Virginia Thomas, Clarence Thomas's wife, She has said, yes, I attended the January 6th Stop the Steal rally. I call it a terrorist attack because that's what happened at the Capitol, okay? So she's now saying, yeah, I did, I attended it. Here's the other part of it. It was in fact, Justice Thomas, who was the only Supreme Court justice who voted to give Donald Trump what he wanted, what Trump wanted to stop the January 6th committee from investigating him investigating his documents, etc. He was the lone vote out of all members of Congress, out of all the Supreme Court justices, excuse me. So we're supposed to believe that his wife's connection to January 6th has nothing to do with his ultimate dissent in that ruling. You know, I think anyone with eyes and ears and who's been following this situation would tell you that it's clear that that influenced how Justice Thomas voted. I think the real problem here is that there's not really any type of precedent for this situation. And what does the Supreme Court do besides dictate precedent and look forward how the law will be applied in the future? 
Now, again, Jen Psaki was asked about this just, I want to say, on Monday during the press briefing, perhaps Tuesday, whenever the news was first broken. And she flat out declined to talk about this. I think, again, just because there's so much uncertainty. What this does show is that the January 6th Select Committee, their probe, it's not going anywhere. Ginny Thomas, at least in Washington, D.C. circles, is known as sort of a, you know, a big time conservative advocate, a big time conservative organizer. And it's yet to be determined just what connection she had with this actual rally and with some of these more extremist militant terrorist figures, like you pointed out, who ended up storming the Capitol. Just being present at the speech doesn't mean you instigated a riot. But again, if there's smoke, there's fire. And clearly the committee thinks that there's a lot of smoke here that they need to investigate. Yeah, and I really think there's something more to it. She says she left early because she got cold. I don't believe that. I actually think she was in the crowd. I believe that somebody tipped her off. She left before Trump's speech according to her narrative, which means to me that somebody told her what Trump was going to say. Or she started hearing rumblings in the crowd about what was about to happen. Somebody tipped her off and she got out of there, if it's even true that she left early. But this is not the first time Clarence Thomas has made a decision that seems significantly connected to a complexity related to his wife. He has refused time and time again to recuse himself from cases that obviously involve his wife on some level that we know of publicly. Why do you think it's so difficult for the brother to just step away from the damn bench for a minute and say, hey, out of the nobility of this office, I have to recuse myself because it's not just about uh, the issue of conflict, it's about the appearance of conflict that I will adhere to. Why hasn't he done that? Well, I think that has to do with, in large part, us as the media mm. and the nation as a whole. You know, when you enable people to behave in certain ways and conduct themselves in a certain manner for, you know, 20, 30 years at this point in time, why would you expect them to change what they've done consistently? Especially someone who I genuinely do think is as educated. Uh, and consistent in his beliefs as Clarence Thomas has been uh, just over the past you know, 25 years or so. So again, part of this is on the media and I think it's smart now uh, that the people who are investigating this perhaps leaked where they might be going to get the focus back on Ginny Thomas, to get the focus back on Justice Thomas heading into Judge Brown Jackson's confirmation hearing. Because this goes to show the Supreme Court, people forget about it, but it might be the most important political body in the country, these are lifetime appointments. Yep. These are people who, again, dictate how the law will be upheld and how people can, you know, craft future legislation. Uh, this is a, a very important battle, especially again if you're a progressive Democrat, considering the current makeup of the court and the three justices that former President Trump got on there during his term in office. Yeah, I have a theory. I think justices get too damn comfortable. I'm for. Supreme Court reform. I think it needs to be a limited appointment that allows for reconfirmation. Here's why I say that. If it was allowed for them to actually have to be reconfirmed every, I don't know, 10 years. Mm -hmm. They don't know who in the hell will be in power 10 years from that day. So maybe they don't make decisions that are squarely and only partisan if they knew that was coming up. Um, lifetime positions, you know, it creates an absolute power dynamic. And we know absolute power corrupts absolutely. Clarence Thomas has become too damn comfortable on that bench. He doesn't even care what it looks like anymore, okay? He's not even trying to hide it. I, I can make the same argument for some other justices, all right? So at this point, Democrats, they're gonna do what they gotta do, hopefully get the confirmation. But then it's going to stop there. You know, really, we have an issue with the Supreme Court. Uh, all of these dynamics that are coming from the Supreme Court, very partisan decisions, uh, decisions along party lines. Uh, some of the rhetoric that comes that's extrajudicial has nothing to do with cases, but it does. Uh, we have to figure out a way to balance that court, or the Chief Justice has to be able to censor those judges on some level. But none of that happens with the Supreme Court. Do you think we will ever get to that place? Well, the Supreme Court is not now another wholly political body. I don't see why not. And I think your suggestion about having to reconfirm justices, you know, five years, 10 years, whatever it is down the line is, is remarkable. Because again, I think this is probably at least 
in my tenure, again, as a political reporter, the most that court reform has ever been during, uh, you know, at the forefront of the public discourse. We've talked about court packing a lot over the last mm-hmm. two years. Yeah. I think this is a better solution, but it shouldn't even just stop there. Again, there is rapid growing support among both Democrats and Republicans for term limiting politicians. Why are we letting these people who have proven over the years that they are not worthy of serving our interests or even doing a good job of handling themselves in crisis? Why are they allowed to stay in Washington? Why are they allowed to stay in in the state capitals for such a long time? I think this is probably the most tuned in and and, uh, focus that the public has been on politics perhaps ever. I think it's probably time that the politicians reflect that focus. And uh, you know, one way of doing that is by putting these self-imposed limits, these sort of oversight, uh, you know, whatever they might be, points or or you know, actual laws in place. And I hope that this is something that continues to be at the forefront of the conversation, even after Judge Brown Jackson's confirmation process has concluded. Very well said, Christian. You are such a remarkable journalist. Your professionalism is above. Most and I have significant respect for you and the work that you do. Keep telling the truth, keep digging deep, keep bringing us the information. Thank you, my friend. Take care, Dr. Ritchie, always a pleasure. Absolutely.